um, here for filling in the pieces, comics biography. We're all going to be talking about um, using comics to tell biographies and stories of notable and um, important people in history. My name is Chris Mountner. I'm the moderator today. Um, let me introduce our panelists. Starting at the left is Anaïs de Pommier. She was born, I'm taking this from NBM's website, in the late 1980s in a small village in the southeast of France. After graduating from the Emile Cole School in Lyon, she created a drawing workshop where regular life drawing classes and other exhibitions are held. Her first graphic novel was done with her childhood friend Mathilde Ramadier, um, and it's Sartre, a biography of the French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, and it's just been released in English and is available at the NBM table upstairs. Um, next to her is Box Brown, the Ignatz award-winning cartoonist. In addition to creating and operating the small press publishing venture Retrofit Comics, Brown is also the author of Andre the Giant, Tetris, the games people play, and Is This Guy For Real? The Unbelievable Tale of Andy Kaufman, which is going to be released by 1st, 2nd in February, February. of next year. Mm -hmm. Um, and next to him is Luke Howard, who, according to his website, and that's where I always get all my information from the internet, was fathered by a fighter jet and mothered by a pile of long, warm laundry. Um, one of his first comics um, was about the life and times of ragtime composer Ernest, Ernest Hogan. Um, he also came out recently, well, now, that comic was named a notable comic in the 2013 edition of the Best American Comic Series. His most recent comics are Talk Dirty to Me and the part memoir, part biography comic, Our Mother, which was published by Retrofit. So um, to start th with this, um, I think the first basic question is why, why your subject? Why that person? Um, you know, I think we all have figures, inspirational figures that we learn about in history or in school or that we read about that inspire us, but rarely do we become obsessed to the point where we want to say, okay, I'm now going to devote a period of my life to writing and drawing about this person's entire life or history or as much as I can. So, I, starting with you, um, you know, what was it that made you want to do, attempt to do a biography of Sartre? Uh, actually, it was my uh, writer uh, who had the idea because she's, um, she has a master on, um, degree master uh, about philosophy and psychology. And um, she, so she was really interested by um, Sartre's life because she works on it. And she asked me, asked me if I wanted to draw something about him. And when she explained to me his life and his particular influence on the last century in France, I said, yeah, of course, it was really interesting. And also his relationship with uh, Simone de Beauvoir, which is a main um, figure, feminist figure in France. Um, so yeah, I found my interest also in their relationship. Did you find your interest growing as you worked on, on the book, oh, the yeah. deepening? Absolutely. Box, what about you? What about those Andy Kaufman, and even, even Tetris, which is a biography of sorts? Yeah, um, you know, all of my subjects, and I don't know, I don't know, maybe this is, I don't know how universal this is, but like, a lot of my subjects are stuff that I was interested in as a child, and then kind of rediscovered as an adult, to the point where I became like obsessed with it as an adult and like trying to fill in these empty gaps like as a kid you, don't, you, you you get like especially in your memory you know you only get recall like a very small percentage of what you're seeing you know what I mean like I would I, I knew very little about Andre the Giant until I was like 27 you know all I really knew that he was like this big huge guy that I saw on TV that for some reason I had like this strong emotional connection to and I think it's the same with Tetris, too. Like, uh, you know, that came out when I was, like, 9 or 10, and it was, like, a, you know, phenomenon uh, amongst me and my friends. And, like, that also was, like, one of the first games that adults played. So it became, like, a strong uh, way for me to bond with, like, my dad over video games in a way that we never did in the past. Like, where he would, like, you know, sit down and play Mario Bros. with me, but never with the same you know, it, uh, with his, uh, as much investment as he did with, like, Tetris. Uh, and and uh, Andy Kaufman is also kind of, well, Andy Kaufman I wasn't obsessed with as a child, but he, I just w got into it later because he was, I, it's, my book's a lot about his pro wrestling career, which I find to be amazing uh, and interesting and unique because uh, 
because like when he was getting into pro wrestling, there was a lot of people that didn't want him to be into pro wrestling because it would make pro wrestling look fake. And uh, what happened was he just did, got into it, another, kind of through a back door and got into it another way and brought it to the world. And what he did made wrestling look more real to the most number of people than like anything that had happened before that. So that's like the connection to pro wrestling for me is that. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, a lot of it's like discovering something about myself that uh, that that I am just like you know looking at why am I interested in this? Why are, why is anybody interested in it? And then kind of going from there. Luke. Yeah, um, I, I was wanting to set out to do some sort of story about ragtime music because I've always had a strong interest in ragtime music. Um, it's arguably like the first um, truly American uh, music genre and a precursor to jazz, so very important in this country. Um, and so I set, uh, set out to make a, uh, like a biography about Scott Joplin because he was always like uh, the main ragtime hero. And I always thought of him as like the f the first ragtime star, um, but when I did some digging, I learned about this guy named Ernest Hogan, this controversial figure, um, who's really kind of um, credited as the father of ragtime. Um, but it has a very shameful history in that um, ragtime really got off the ground because this man, Ernest Hogan, was uh, um, he wrote a very uh, you know. A racist uh, tune that gained popularity in the white community and so something uh, like ragtime wasn't popular and then he wrote this awful tune it became extremely popular but that also paved the way for uh, um, truer artists like Scott Joplin and stuff like that and so once I discovered this um, kind of hidden part of uh, the history of ragtime I, I just felt compelled to explore more about it and it's something that's very, very hard to find stuff about because people kind of don't want to talk about it. They want to talk about like the the, uh, the happier stuff, like Scott Joplin and stuff, when it was something we could be more proud of. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, <clears throat> I'm doing a book right now about um, the history. Well, it's kind of like about how cannabis became illegal in the United States, and um, look, it starts off in India, and I'm looking back at. At India, and I kind of wanted to get perspective of, of like an Indian person, you know, and so a lot of times, like, you know, if I'm gonna use like a documentary film as research, I'll use something from the BBC because I think of them as like, you know, a very, uh, you know, they're really good at presenting the facts. They're like a trusting, trustable source, but trying to find out what the average person thought of the British crown in India, like the average Indian person thought of the British crown via BBC. They, I mean, BBC made it seem like nobody in India cared at all that they were like occupying their country and like totally exploiting them so bad. And I was like, that, I just knew, I was like, no, no, no. So I had to do like so much more research to find to like dig up people that were writing about, you know, from that other perspective, you know what I mean? It's crazy, the stuff, it, cause you know, it gets buried, the, the mm -hmm. uglier side of things gets buried. Well, I, I definitely want to talk about the uglier side of things as we go on, but let's, let's first, let's talk about um, happier things. Uh, let's talk about, re let's talk about research. Cause that, that, this kind of fascinates <laughs> me. Um, so, like, how did you go about um, getting any information on your chosen subject, specifically for your books? Um, and, like, did you interview anybody? Did you, if, if in your case, box where people were still living? And even with you, look with the book you did about your mom, because that is kind of part biography in some ways. Uh, and, and, Ani, starting with you, because I'm interested, I know you, you co-wrote, you worked on this book with your friend, but, like just the visual language, you're having to portray a time in history, you know, many decades ago, times where you weren't born. How, you know, what kind of research did you have to do, not only to portray um, Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, but to pay, portray France um, during that time period? Oh, actually, it was so much. Uh, I spent hours to look at uh, pictures of Paris and of uh, clothes and. Uh, um, and cars and everything on, online, especially. Um, 
Um, also, with some books I had, um, really old books I found in the um, library too. And we have the chains in France who have a really um, efficient, um, how to say, um, television uh, ar archives mm -hmm. um, called INA. And there is so many videos uh, about that, but also about uh, um, the Paris, like old Paris. And so I based my research uh, on, on everything, um, yeah, between videos and pictures, something like that. If you had to guesstimate, how much how much time do you think you probably spent oh, on the research much. angle? <laughs> what, by what point did you say, okay, I, this is it, I have to stop? A, sp I'm, I'm sort of, a book like Satra, someone who's, I'm going to address this later, but someone who's that well-known and established, yeah. like at what point do you say, okay, this is, this. I can only take this much? Um, I think I, I never had this stop because when I was um, drawing, um, let's say at the middle of the book, for example, I had so many other stuff to uh, look for because it was maybe a new town or an older Sartre to or other characters who were coming um, in the story. So uh, I think I, I never had enough um, references. Actually, um, these days I looked at my original uh, file and I, I had like 3,500 documents. So, yeah, it was a really long time. That's a lot of documents. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. Box, how about you? Um, yeah, I mean, for, it's different, I guess, for different ones. Like, for the Andrew the Giant book, I felt like it was more of, like, a constructive process where I was, like, tr really trying to find as many stories as I could find to kind of... Because there's only so many. There's so, such few things really written about Andre that it was... It was um, I was like so voraciously looking for anything that I could find information wise and, and trying to build the story out of all these disparate things. The Tetris book, there's so much that's been written about Tetris that it was more of like a paring down where it was like you're discarding stuff and because there's so much detail involved, and especially in the court cases and things like that. Um, uh, you know, some of the most exciting things for me were. Uh, like in, in, in Andre's story, like if he was in a different profession, pretty much all of his coworkers would probably still be alive. Like they're, you know, they'd be like in their 70s, but probably still alive. Uh, pro wrestling, like a lot of them are dead. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of the people were dead. Like and one dude, one guy I talked to for the book, um, who got into a fist fight with Andre the Giant, Black Jack Mulligan. Uh, I talked to him, and he died like a year later, like after the book came out. So he's dead. And like um, uh, HBO is doing a documentary about about Andre, and um, so they really wanted to talk to Black Jack Mulligan, and I, and it was like right after he died, they started doing this thing. So I had to I forwarded them my interview with Black Jack, which was over Facebook Messenger, and it was really incoherent, like. He's not really good at typing, and he was like super angry and really hard to understand what he was talking about half the time. Uh, but he he was crazy. He's a crazy guy. And then um, and then uh, also for the for the Andy Kaufman book, I just got to talk to a lot of different people on the phone, which was cool. Um, I talked to Bob Zamuda, who's like Andy's writing partner on the phone. He was really funny. Uh, he also started um, a really famous comedy. I forget what it's called, what it was called now. It was like a, a comedy uh, fundraising event that they used to have on HBO. Uh, this guy started it. So he was really funny. And then I talked to this other guy, um, Jim Cornette, who's a pro wrestling manager. And he's like this crazy loudmouth dude on TV and on the phone. Like he's the same. <laughs> like there's no difference. So like it was like super funny and fun to talk to, talk to that, talk to those people and stuff. Um, ideally, I would like to do a book at some point that's just first person interviews and no just just this account only and try to do as little digging from other sources but I mean there's just you have to do it though I mean even if I was just doing it from primary sources you'd still have to go back and do all this research and just to know the story I don't know um, yeah it's a lot of that stuff I just find it's easier to do biography if you make it up, so I just make it up. <laughs> that works. Um, no, I mean, with Ernest Hogan, it, it was particularly hard because if you look him up on Wikipedia, 
there's like four sentences. Um, and that was very frustrating. And so for that sp specific story, uh, it really was kind of just trying to dig up um, what I could in uh, musical history books. Um, I, I also found myself uh, connected with a man who was making or trying to make a documentary about Ernest Hogan uh, that eventually fell through, his funding fell through, but he was able to dig up stuff. Um, and so I was kind of able to piggyback on that research, finding someone who had already done some of the groundwork. Um, and then, you know, uh, Ernest Hogan ended up being like the, the first uh, black American uh, to have a leading role on Broadway. So once I found that out, I was able to kind of like dig into like um, the history of Broadway and learn more about him through that. Um, and then, you know, going to, uh, you know, libraries and um, looking through microfish reels or whatever to try to get, you know, any articles I could about uh, shows that would come out that, that were starring him and that kind of thing. Because he, he also ended up being the, the highest paid black performer ever um, on Broadway for a very long time. Um, so when I came at it from that angle, I realized I was able to find more information. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then, you know, in, in terms of, uh, you know, the story of, with my mom, that was a lot easier because I wasn't, I was relying on my, my own memory, you know, having been there, and then, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations, luckily she's still alive, so, um, you know, the source is right there, so that's just. Did you interview other family members when making that comic? I kind of purposely avoided that because the, the dynamic in that story is like, what was my experience like versus what is what was her experience like and how were, what's the disconnect there? All right. Um, well, let's, I, just, let's kind of pull you on that, which is, you know, with our mother, you're, you're working in a different combination. And I think there is biography there. There's memoir in there too, but you're also telling, and then you're also fictionalizing stuff. And I, I want to talk about that a little more in general. But, but Luke, specifically with you, you know, can you talk a little bit about coming to that, like their, your mindset and coming to our mother versus the Hogan comic, and if they, if it required any kind of a different a different approach to some degree, because it's a very there are two very different comics, but they have some there are overlaps, I think. Yeah, I mean, the, this was obviously such a personal and emotionally draining story to work on. Um, whereas, you know, Ernest, like the story about Ernest Hogan, you know, it was just, maybe it's a little more like what uh, Box was talking about, where it was something I had like a personal interest in, or I, I was a big fan of this music. Um, so there was a lot more like fun, I guess, in the, or pleasure in the process of learning more about this information. Um, you know, by contrast though, uh, this story about my mother um, ended up being like surprisingly difficult as I dug deeper into it. Right. Um, Anna, you, you did a biography of a figure who is, you know, very famous and very well documented. And I mean, like, as you yourself noted, there are poor scores and scores of books and material to pour through. What um, was it, were you daunted at all in doing this? Uh, Sorry? Were you, were you what was the biggest challenge for you in doing that, given that it is such a, he was such a, he's such a famous and, and, and beloved in many circles figure? Especially since you're coming at it, you know, your, 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 your co-author is the one who kind of approached you, and you kind of had to learn as you were going in, in many respects. So what, what, was, what was the challenge for you to learn as you go and, and being, working on a biography of someone who many biographies have already writ, been written about? Oh, yeah. Actually, in France, we have a really big specialist of uh, him. She is, um, her name is uh, Annie Cohen-Solal. Uh, my writer met her twice. Or, or three times, I don't remember. Um, I think we, Mathilde had, um, so my writer, had um, her difficulties were to be um, uh, strong enough to, like so well documented, uh, and uh, um, she, she, she was young, she's still young, and you know, in France sometimes with philosophers and, and intellectuals, they can be really mean. <laughs> like, oh, you're young, what do you want to say about <laughs> stuff, right? Um, so for her, I think her fear was, was to not be able to bring a true thought for tr such specialists in France, mm -hmm. something like this. Um, from my point of view, um, actually I was the first uh, reader of uh, our book, let's <laughs> say. 
So um, it was really interesting for me because I wanted to respect Mathilde's point of view about mm -hmm. Sartre. Um, so I, yeah, um, I almost uh, had an, an idea about Sartre um, as a character, not uh, almost fictional at w one point. Um, because I was reading a story, uh, stories at, at the bar, uh, inside a, a home, meeting people. So it was, it was not directly, um, um, yeah, it was just my vision uh, through my writer eyes. So it helps me so much to not have this pressure she had right. to, to have a really true um, uh, knowledge about that, let's say. Did she take the brunt of it in some, some regard? The, the, she was at the forefront and you were kind of standing behind in, in uh, some regard? Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, she, I think she, she really did a good job. And when we were in, in a festival in France, for example, and yeah. together, um, she, she had so many good uh, reviews about uh, uh, really Great. strong professors, intellectuals. So. Um, I wanted to talk about point of view because I think it's really important in biographies and it's something that a lot of like prose biographies, it's, it, you read a lot of the time, they often, it's important for the author to have, uh, be coming at their subject at, with a particular kernel or, or core uh, story that they want to tell. Um, and for, like, for example, the example I'm thinking of is Michael Tisserand's book, biography of uh, Crazy Cat creator George Harriman. Um, you know, the core through there is the fact that he looks at Harriman's racial heritage, his hidden racial heritage, and uses that as kind of a guideline throughout the book to talk about um, how it affected and influenced his work as a cartoonist. So my question to the three of you is, um, you know, what was your focal point? In writing these in the biographies, what was the the nugget or the central through line for you that you wanted to make sure the reader understood or felt it was the most important thing? Box, for example, I I know in you mentioned it yourself in the Andy Kaufman book, you're very focused on his pro wrestling days. Mm. So let me I'll throw that up. I'll throw it up into the three of you then. Well, the Andre book I focused on his comedy days, so. Yeah, well, that makes sense. <laughs> he was a great improv comic. Um, I don't know. I definitely was doing that with the Annie Kaufman book. I'm not sure. I definitely had a th some sort of through line with the, the Tetris book. I was kind of trying to figure out what's, you know, because Tetris is such a universally, uh, like a so universally beloved game, I wanted to kind of figure out, like, what is the connection the, the human connection to this this game, and then I kept going back and back, uh, and then I started the book at, like at the beginning of time, kind of, or like when when humans began to create art, um, because I just think that there's some kind of primal uh, drive that, that makes us play games, and and that is sonic, or, or makes us create games, and that's kind of like the same drive that artists have. Um, so, I mean, I think that was what was going on in Tetris. Um, and uh, Andre the Giant, I just really wanted to, to, to paint Andre as, like, a human and, and put his, you know, because he's so, lar so much larger than, larger than life. And, uh, but, but in actuality, he was, like, a, uh, you know, disabled because of his size, and he ended up dying young. And I really wanted to focus on that aspect of him as a regular, as much as you could be like a regular person. Um, yeah, sometimes I feel like that stuff is unconscious and doesn't really, I mean, I guess in my writing, it's kind of, that's just kind of how I do it, where it's like unconscious and I'm not sure. It just kind of comes out at the end. You're like, oh yeah, that was the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's less planned out. I kind of just work more, I try to work spontaneously like that. Right. Anais, what was the what was the one central thing you you know as the artist felt like you wanted the reader to understand about Satra that you wanted to get across? Um, actually, from my point of view, I wanted to show that another um, aspect of Satra's personality because he, he was for sure somewhat serious about philosophy and all the stuff like that. But he had also a lot of humor, for example, and. Uh, when he was a young, he was he was good in class, very well, good student, for example. Mm -hmm. But he was uh, really messy, uh, not messy. Um, 
uh, like he, he, he made so many pranks with his friend or something like that. He was not a really calm guy. Um, um, he, so was, he wasn't good with his money. He was, sorry? Was, he wasn't very careful with his, uh, careful with his money? Or? Not with money, like really to do... Oh God, sorry for the That's English. That's okay. Um, uh, perfectly like, yeah, fine. He was um, not serious outside of the school. Okay. So something like that. Um, and yeah, for me it was really interesting to show also, like, he was a human. Not yeah, and, right. Uh, not just an intellectual figure. Um, and for, for us, the, the main line was uh, also the, the meetings he had all his life with so many people, all intellectual actually, and especially with Simone de Beauvoir, because they, they were a, a really particular couple, uh, <laughs> and they helped each other really, really much in their own um, um, uh, books and uh, way to write. So, in, because you, you cannot say everything about someone in one book, mm -hmm. it's impossible. And if we wanted to to explain really well the idea of Sartre, uh, it, it, we should have done like ten books at least. Right. 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 So it was we we choose to to really to, yes to to. Um, speak about how he interacted with other people and how it bring um, bring him to think as he thought. Right. Right. Yeah. I, th I think for me, it it was just I, I got really sad when I went to write this thing about Scott Joplin and I found out about this guy named Ernest Hogan and how little there was about him and I just felt compelled to. Uh, to know more about this tragic story. I mean, he's a really, it's a really sad story that um, he did so much with his life and he's responsible for so much. In a lot of ways, you could say, like, he gave us jazz um, because he gave us ragtime um, and therefore, you know, rock and roll and, you know, like uh, the through line leading from him uh, kind of like putting ragtime on the scene. Uh, it's hard to measure, like, how important that was. Um, and yet, um, the unfortunate sacrifice that he had to make for that uh, made him a figure that nobody wants to remember. Right. Um, and and it's not that I felt like I wanted to, you know, like justify his choices or anything like that. But I guess I wanted I, w I wanted to explore that kernel of like how innovation is often like born out of like you know evil choices. Um, and like how porn uh, brought us all this stuff on the internet. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's a lovely analogy. Um, okay, well, I want, let's talk about the Hogan comic a little more because, um, you know, the Hogan, Hogan's most famous song is called, all, and I apologize in advance, is called All Coons Look Alike to Me, and that's what you decided, uh, titled. And it makes sense because this is the, the song he's most noted for, but also the one that, that plagued him and he died regretting um, entitling his comic this. And you can't tell this story, you can't tell Hogan's story without, without confronting blackface, without confronting issues of race and, un and racial slurs and, you know, the reality of life, you know, in turn, turn early, late 19th, early 20th century America. So for you, um, Luke, and for, and for everyone else on the panel, you know, what, what was the biggest challenge about for you, writing a comic about dealing with such a weighty subject and controversial subject, and just writing about someone who does not share your background, not even in terms of like coming from another time, but coming, being of a different race, a different culture, a different gender, a different sexuality. Yeah, I've thought about it a lot because this is like the first long form comic I did, and um, it's a it's a really you know it's a silent comic. It's it's a it has to be a very like simplified. Um, uh, uh, you know, expression of the issues involved. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like I've learned a lot since then and I would approach it very differently, especially being, you know, a white, straight male um, trying to tell this, you know, important story about a marginalized figure in history. Um, uh, it, it brings up a lot of questions for me about, like, is it even my place to tell that story? Um, you know, did I consult enough people um, uh, that weren't white? Um, when I was like gathering information about this um, sort of stuff, and uh, and it's not that I'm no longer, I'm still you know proud of 
it, and uh, I, I still am glad that I um, dug up the information I did and um, was able to learn that information. But um, it was it, it it was a challenge. It was a challenge to um, to try to tell the story and understand um, the, uh, the life of somebody that I have no um, experience in, you know what I mean? Like, I've never had to deal with the things he obviously would have to deal with, you know? And I, I would never have to make the choices of, like, I have this music that I love, but nobody's paying attention to it, but if I start performing it in blackface, um, maybe it will, and it did, you know? And then having to, like, live with that shame, right? Um, I can only kind of imagine that um, as, you know, like a white man. Um, so I think that, that that alone is just like, yeah, I don't know fully like how to address that challenge. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's like, it's an important thing uh, for me and everyone to be thinking about. Right. There's a scene in an Andre the Giant book where Andre uses a racial slur. Uh, and uh, it was one of those things like, uh, you know, I had probably written part of the book when I came across this story. Um, but I felt like I had to put it in there because it would be, if, if I didn't purposely didn't put it in there because it was ugly, then it's worse than not than putting it in, not putting it in there because then you're hiding this aspect of Andre the Giant. You know what I mean? So, uh, and I wanted to put it in there. Also, the reason it was it was an easy decision was because. Uh, the, the two people, like the two people involved, Andre and this other guy, Bad News Brown, Bad News Allen, uh, made up, made up afterwards. So it was like kind of a redeemable moment for him later on, which was much later too. It was like six years later that they, they, you know, uh, Bad News always like avoided him, and then, uh, but then they eventually, you know, made up or whatever. Uh, but uh, that was another part of the humanization I wanted to do with Andre is that he's not, you know, he is a flawed individual in, in as as all people are, you know. That I, I don't know. I don't think he's any more flawed really than all, anybody else who's made mistakes before. So. Right. Um, well, let me, let's extend that. I'm going to broaden that question a little and just ask: How do you, you know? As you mentioned, every, everyone's flawed, and when you're writing a biography, you have to confront and find a way to talk about those flaws, those very personal and real flaws. Um, and it can be hard, difficult, especially if it's a character you admire or someone you're, you know, depending on what your focus of the book is. So, um, you know, going through, going down the line, like, you know, how, do you, how did you deal with that challenge? You, not just in terms of, um, um, you know, scripting or words, but in visually. Um, and interpreting it, you know, in, in a visual sense. Um, how did you deal with, you know, the more unlikable aspects of the person you were writing about? Um, in our case, we actually really tried to put some stuff like that inside the book because we didn't want it to make like just positive stuff about that. Um, um, yeah, we speak about, for example, during the Second World, World War, uh, Sart was and so the Nazis were uh, in Paris for the occupation. Um, and he, he wanted to resist, but he actually didn't really know how to do that. Um, so he writed uh, a lot. He tried with Simone de Beauvoir to uh, go in the south of France, who were free, free dawn, um, and to, to, yeah, to make a, like a, a club, let's say, of intellectual to write, but it never worked um, because he was not really well organized. Uh, it's the same during the Algerian war in, um, in 1960. Um, it was, it, it didn't maybe speak enough or louder. Uh, so we talk about that inside the book, even if we, it's not like for uh, pages 10 pages. Yeah. Um, uh, we thought it was important because nobody is like uh, perfect, first of all. And, and it's, but also, um, uh, he, he had so many other actions, like uh, for the war in uh, Indochine, for example. Uh, yeah, he went in the street, he spoke with politics. Uh, so yeah, it's a balance uh, at the end. Right. 
Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> when I was working on the Tetris book. It doesn't really reflect poorly on the creator of Tetris, but one of the one of the people who helped him create Tetris and was like a very close friend of his uh, actually murdered his whole family and him and killed killed himself. Um, and which is not really that much to do with Tetris, except for that this guy was there for the entire thing. And then he, but he was kind of a tangential player. He was like a, a Alexi's friend and helped him with it. And, but they were always together and he was always there. And then he, you know, he got out of Russia too. He came to the United States and he ended up starting a business that failed. And he, uh, you know, it's hard to, this was the hardest part of it, was figuring how to write about why this person did this without ever actually knowing. And, like, nobody could know. You could only speculate. Um, but this was, like, a weird part of my research that turned into from Tetris to what's, what are family annihilators like? It's, like, a specific way to describe people that kill their whole families and like there's people that study just that and like it's actually what happened with this guy was actually extremely common uh, it's almost always is like not almost always but a lot of times it's a father who has recently lost a lot of money and, or failed in business or failed in some other way that he, he they're seeing themselves as a failure and they can't possibly return from this failure so they take their whole family with them um, and this happened to like a dude in, that was like involved in Tetris, and I talked to like one of their friends about it, and I was like, "Well, what, what was that like? How did that happen?" And he's like, "Oh, it was terrible, and you know, um, you know, all these things." But and it, 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 the book is ostensibly something that a 12-year-old could read, or so, you know, because it's just about the history of this game. But also, there's this one scene in it about a guy who kills his whole family. Um, but I had to put it in there. How do you not put that in there? Um, but I just tried to approach it as tactfully as I could, and I didn't show any violence, um, only like the reaction to the death and things like mm -hmm. that. So that was challenging. Right. Uh, I think for the Ernest Project, it was sort of the uh, opposite issue in that this figure was mostly negative in, in terms of history, and so there was plenty of that stuff. And this story in general uh, was about that negative mm -hmm. stuff. So I think for me it was more the challenge of trying to find the like humanity and the honesty that that was behind that um, so that it wasn't just like, oh, look at this bad thing and look at this bad thing, right? Trying to actually show the, uh, the emotional turmoil that he right. must have been going through and the kind of conflict um, that he was facing um, day to day when he was like, you know, uh, performing in blackface. Uh, I mean, people, uh, black Americans performed in blackface and they still like put shoe polish on and stuff like that. It's it's crazy. Um, and then the, I guess the other challenge was just, you know, finding ways to show that imagery um, because it's such like, it's such loaded and challenging imagery. Like how do you, how do you do a story about a blackface performer without like showing that stuff? Mm -hmm. And how do you, how do, you do it, uh, I guess, honestly, but also uh, not exploitative? Um, and because this was a, uh, like a silent uh, comic, I, I made the choice of kind of recreating a lot of the, the artwork, um, like that awful imagery from that time that would be on like the album covers and that kind of stuff, or on the sheet music. Um, so it, when you would like hear um, Ernest like performing this song, uh, instead of like hearing the lyrics, um, you would you know like it was like the war balloons were filled with that imagery or whatever. Right. Um, yeah. So it was kind of more trying to find a way to I don't know. Show, yeah. Show like, that good stuff. Right. Like, right. Right. Show him. Show him. Show him as human and not a villain. Yeah. yeah exactly. Um, well, like well and. Extending that, it sounds a little kind of not, not obviously not a one for one overlap, but in our mother, you know, because your relationship was fraught with her, it seemed like it was important to you reading to provide her side of the story also and to deal with show what she was dealing with as well during that time during when, when growing up. Is that, yeah. is that accurate? 
Yeah, and I think it was it was hard not to, like, how do you depict the mom who is neglectful, who you also just love, um, uh, um, without, like, you know, making her out to be the bad guy, and also just, like, knowing that your mom's going to read it and you don't want to hurt her. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it challenged, it challenged our relationship um, afterwards, and it wasn't like, I mean, she, you know, we worked on it together, um, so she knew it was happening, but it still, like, hurt her to, like, read it and, like, you know, see that, like, uh, I, you know, that, that that was a true thing about our relationship, or that, like, she wasn't always the perfect mother, and, mm -hmm. you know, um, so I, I think, I had to kind of strike a balance between uh, like trying to protect that our relationship in real life, but also not being afraid to be honest about right. it as well. Um, comics, because they can include, because they require such a huge investment of time and effort, um, they tend to be, you know, brevity is important. Um, I think uh, comics and often comic biographies have to compress. I mean, biographies in general, you have to compress. It's the art of leaving things out. But I think that's more so true in comics. Um, so you have to omit important characters, compress conversations. You have to decide, you know, what you're going to keep in and what you're going to leave out. So, you know, how did you how did you juggle, you know, as you're going through this book, uh, each of your books, um, what what to what to what to toss out to the side, and and what to keep. I mean, I think sometimes you just go, you, I mean, I'll be like writing and be like, get, I'll get like a few pages into, into like thumbnailing a sequence and be like, this is like in a tangent somewhere, really. You know, you have to kind of, I guess you start realizing when, as soon as you start leaving the main story that this is a tangent or like this is that. Uh, and it's like you really want to keep things tightly focused on your subject, like this the book I'm doing now about cannabis, like, a lot of times it overlaps with other stories that are, like, incredibly compelling, like, um, involved, in, like, in the history of jazz, marijuana is, like, very much involved in that, but it's, like, I have to keep reminding myself, like, I'm not really making a book about marijuana and, j and jazz, you know what I mean? Like, that is something that I want to touch on, but it's really about the legality of this, and, you know, that jazz was used as, like, a uh, something that they, you know, uh, people pointed to as like this awful thing sometimes, but, but it's y you can feel the tangent coming on, and you have to, I always am just like, no, it's just this thing. It's, you have to keep, remain focused because, you know, you don't want to go too far off. For us, um, I think it depends on, on um, which. Um, for, for Mathieu, uh, for example, she chose to, for example, not um, uh, showing really famous trips they did, like in Cuba or something like that. Um, so it was um, uh, some some choices. For example, uh, we insist a lot of about during 10 years between like um, 1935 and 1945, um, because it was a key moment for Sartre. Um, uh, about how he, he, he changed his mind uh, in coffee and his thoughts. So we spent much more time to explain these moments, and also right. because it was a war, and obviously changed so many things, also in the country, for sure. Um, it's uh, I, I think it's, a, it's still a balance between what, she, what is important to say to make you understand who he was and what is not. Sometimes a little scene where it's not happening that much things, it's just a conversation between two characters can um, make you understand much more of who he was or the other right. character too than explain like, okay, this book is telling, uh, uh, the story of this book is la la right. la 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 Yeah. Yeah, like sometimes, yeah, you know, yeah, it'll be like some little thing that seems like it's not connected or something, but it tells you something very important about the character. Yeah, that's true. I kind of almost feel like there's there's a bit of like alchemy in it too, where, and then maybe this sort of touches on what Box was saying as well, but there's, you just start to get a feeling uh, when something doesn't feel right. Mm. Um, 
and it's almost like the story is like telling you like um no i don't want to go there yeah. or like yeah, yeah. like you know this you're going down the wrong road or right. something like that um, right so, yeah, like sometimes I'll be like, I know I need to get here, and then there's this thing in the way, kind of. So you kind of just dodge that part. <laughs> be like, eh, that's not as important to this thing. I don't know, it's hard to explain. How much mapping out did you guys do? Did you like, did you have like bulletin boards like with like notes on them? Like, I did that a little bit with Tetris uh, because there's so many characters in it. Uh, like with Andre the Giant, there's like one central character. It's right. Like but. And with Tetris, there's the one creator of Tetris, but there's like so many people involved that I drew portraits of all the characters and kind of mapped out how they were connected to each other because there's like all these different businesses involved too and just Nintendo and Sega and all this different stuff. So I did, did do that for my own when I was starting on the book just to get my bearings kind of uh, with who the characters were. Did you? Like, like scripted out and everything? Um, because I, I was not the one to uh, write uh, the story, I did not do that. But uh, I had, for the drawing parts, I had so many characters printed Where's in front that? of mine, yeah. uh, just to remember sometimes. Some are really famous, like al also for someone who don't read so many books, let's say, like uh, Albert Camus, for example, in fact, super famous. But some others I didn't know, uh, Jean Laurent Bost. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, for me, it's like no one. Um, then, I, thanks to the books, I discovered that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, just to uh, have a little remind, and also with little sketches, um, also for the kind of clauses for my main characters, uh, Sartre and Beauvoir, um, like in either the 30s or in the 50s, how did they, um, um, uh, what they, did they were? Right. Uh, it's always so like with men's clothes, it's very subtle, the differences, because it's like, you pretty much all wear suits for a really long yeah. time, but it, it but it's slightly different. different. Yeah, yeah, like like, like in the thirties. Yeah, like in, uh, drawing those characters in the thirties, they all hike yeah. their pants up really high. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel like uh, I got, every time I get into what, like working on a project, eventually like the wall above my drawing table looks like I don't know something out of like a Beautiful Mind or Seven or something, yeah. and it's like <laughs> pictures everywhere and like yarn pointing from here to here. <laughs> it's a, like a crazy person's. It, it's, that always happens to me in the beginning, but by like, you know, the first third done with the book, I haven't changed anything on the bulletin board, and there's still references up from page two or three. But I, so I always love doing that stuff in the beginning. But once it becomes, once you go into the production mode, it's something different entirely. I mean. Did you have to keep like photos of your characters up to be like, oh wait, that's right, I gotta draw Sartre with this kind of a nose? I kind of start, well the way I draw usually it's like, the first few times I draw the character are from different photos, but then it just becomes this cartoon version of the character, like, Andy kind of looks different in every panel, but he always has a, his like mole that's always there, so you know that's, that's him. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like after a while you get you learn the um, like the foundation of the character, like how you see like Matt Groening draw Homer, and it's like, oh, you draw a circle, and then you draw an M for right. his hair, yeah, and then yeah. a G for his ear, or you know, like so. Once you get a once you get a certain, there's always like this point uh, where where you're like a certain number of pages in where it's like drawing that character becomes it's just the second shape. nature. Yeah, yeah, right? just like oh, it's yeah. the four forehead. What, what kind of uh, critical feedback did you get from your books, like once they came out? Did any did historians or, or scholars contact you like at all and be like, "No, you're wrong. You got you got everything wrong." Or they were like, "What did you did you hear back from people who, um, you know, who spent their lives working on this, whether it's philosophy, French philosophy, or ragtime music, or wrestling?" I've heard I've heard a handful of things from wrestling people that would. That are very minor things. They'd be like, "Oh, uh, see, they never. These two guys. This guy retired like one year before this guy actually came out of the scene. But it would uh, never anything major, really. It's always been like minor things like that, tiny details." For me, it was the same thing. Like it was maybe the first festival, like really the main presentation of the book. And one guy arrived in and said, "You know, on this page there is a plane." And it was your year, it's like uh, 1988, and actually it was created in 1980, 
1949, something like that, no? And the, it was not the same mo uh, motors and everything. So, okay, <laughs> like for one year. And actually, um, he, he said, no, because if it's published again, you will need to correct that. <laughs> so, okay, okay. I'll keep I, that I, in mind. I, yeah. that, okay. <laughs> but ma major things, I neither. So mm. it was always little deta details or something like that. Right. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of drama around mine um, because it's such uh, sensitive material. Um, I got, like, from people that uh, that had read it that knew, you know, knew about ragtime, it was very interesting to them. And they, like, wanted to talk about it. Um, and they, I didn't get a lot of, like, this is inaccurate because most of that information is people don't know. Um, so I didn't feel like people, there was, there's probably like five people in America who could call me out on anything. Um, and then uh, at conventions, there was always this interesting tension. Uh, I felt like I got a lot of like fury from uh, white people um, and a lot of interesting conversations from people of color. Um, and I, I think some of that is just because, uh, you know, um, there's a hypersensitivity to this stuff. Uh, you know, like an overcompensation right. from white people where they're like, I need to like be particularly offended by things um, in order to kind of like compensate for, you know, my ancestors and all, you know, all my privilege, um, which isn't bad either. But um, I think once I was able to get people to read it, it usually uh, resulted in like a positive conversation. And I think, um, you know, I, I ended up meeting a few other like uh, cartoonists of color, uh, the you know a good friend of mine, Joel Christian Glenn, who his whole thing is like he's a cartoonist that writes like obscure um, Black American history comics, and like we were able to like really connect over it. Um, uh, he wrote a comic about there's a, a character, a character, a real guy named Box Brown. Right, the, like, the, the, yeah. the the real Box Brown, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> as opposed to this guy here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, I, I stopped printing it um, because I I just couldn't handle the the kind of like whiplash drama right. that, you know, when I'd have that on the table, it was all all my experience at conventions was about. Um, Why is that on the table? Yeah. Right. I always fear that when I go on like book tour, there's going to be like, Actually, when I was going touring for Andre the Giant, I was convinced that there would be like some old school wrestler there that wanted to beat me up, <laughs> uh, but there wasn't. And I always, th when I'm Tetris too, I think that there's going to be somebody there that's going to like come to my talk and be like, "No, that this is wrong for this reason. This is wrong for this reason. This is wrong for this reason." But that's never happened. I don't. I mean, like no one would go out to your signing just to do that to you. I mean, it would. I hope not anyway. I don't know what, I think we are just about out of time. Do we do we have time for any questions? No. Okay. We, <laughs> I apologize. Um, I had so many questions. I still have more. Thank you very much to everybody for. Thank you. Thank you.